Hi, and welcome to Socratic Studios. On this podcast, you can enjoy deep discussions and interviews about everything science-related with the best minds in the field. I'm Vishnu, and today's topic will be a protein that can switch between its many folds in an instant. With me today, I have Acacia Dishman, a researcher and student at the Medical College of Wisconsin. She studied the evolutionary history of a specific metamorphic protein. Welcome, Ms. Dishman. It's an honor to have you on the podcast. So my first question was, what is a protein in the first place and why does it need to fold? That's a great question. So proteins are really important biological molecules um, that are used to sustain basically every form of life. So proteins are linear chains of amino acids and things that are proteins are antibodies, enzymes, hormones. Proteins are used to send signals in the body, um, to run the immune system, to turn food into energy, to contract muscle, to send signals between brain cells. Proteins do um, a very broad variety of important functions in the human body and in in all forms of life. Um, So yeah, at the molecular level, proteins are linear chains of amino acids, and they can be sort of thought of as beads on a string, and they need to fold up into special shapes in order to do their specific functions. Um, So just because two amino acids are far from each other in the linear protein before it folds um, doesn't mean they won't be close to each other when the protein is folded. Um, And so for the protein to fold up into the correct shape will allow it to do Um, functions like catalyzing reactions or binding to certain other proteins or receptors on cells. Um, And most proteins can't do those functions unless they're folded up into a really specific structure. All right. Um, And can you expand a little bit on what exactly amino acids are? Yeah, great question. So there are 20 different types of amino acids, and they're small molecules composed of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and sometimes sulfur. Um, And some of them are positively charged, some are negatively charged, some are hydrophobic, meaning they don't like to be exposed to water, and some are hydrophilic, and they do like to be exposed to water. Some are bigger, some are smaller. And so the, the way the amino acids are organized in the amino acid chain that makes up the protein dictates the way in which the protein will fold. All right. Um, So when did people first start to realize that there were different ways in which proteins could fold? Um, In other words, when were fold switching proteins first discovered? Yeah, that's a great question. So the term uh, metamorphic proteins, which is used to describe proteins that can reversibly switch between multiple different folded structures, was first coined in 2008. Um, Before that, a couple fold switching proteins had been discovered, but um, they were thought to be pretty rare anomalies. Um, But in 2008, the protein XCL1 that I focused on in my paper um, was discovered to switch between two different folds, um, and this prompted the invention of the term metamorphic protein. However, more recently, a paper came out um, from the lab of Lauren Porter in 2018, where she found that there are actually um, 96 different fold switching proteins that already have their structure solved and deposited in the protein data bank, which is a data bank of um, every protein that we know the structure of. Um, And so now when they were first discovered, we thought there was maybe like 10 of them. Um, Now it seems like there's at least 96, but um, Lauren has hypothesized that up to 4% of all protein structures that we have might be fold switching proteins, um, which would be thousands of proteins um, that could switch folds. All right. And is there a distinction between fold switching proteins and metamorphic proteins, or are they the same thing? That's a good question. Um, These definitions are still being um, solidified in the field, I would say, but um, Metamorphic proteins are a specific type of fold switching proteins. Other fold switching proteins would include 
proteins that switch folds but do so irreversibly, um, such as the proteins that make up um, amyloid plaques, for example, in Alzheimer's patients. Um, there could also be fold switching proteins that go from um, from like only a partially structured fold to a more structured fold. Uh, so metamorphic proteins are a type of fold switching proteins. All right. So basically metamorphic, metamorphic proteins are fold switching proteins that can switch back and forth um, from its different structures really quickly or mm -hmm. yeah, just immediately. Yeah. And fold switching proteins, um, once they switch to a certain fold, they stay in that fold. Fold switching proteins is a bigger family of proteins that can include proteins that switch and stay in the fold or metamorphic proteins or um, other yeah. types of folds. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Um, so the the protein that uh, you and your collaborators were, were focusing on, the XCL1 protein, mm -hmm. is a metamorphic protein. And mm -hmm. you were able to um, uh, reconstruct the entire uh, evolutionary history of this protein. But b before we get into that, could you just tell us a little bit of the basics of the protein and its different folds and its various um, functions based on those different folds? Yes, great question. So XCL1 is an immune system protein. It's a member of a family of proteins called chemokines, which help to orchestrate the immune response. And their job is basically to tell white blood cells where to go in the body. And most chemokine proteins do this by um, using two main functions. One is to bind to receptors on white blood cell surfaces, and the other is to bind to glycosaminoglycans, which are protein sugars in the extracellular matrix. Um, and it can bind to those, which helps the chemokines to form a concentration gradient. And then white blood cells know to migrate from areas of low chemokine concentration to high chemokine concentration. XCL1 does those two main functions using its two different folds. So um, one of the folds binds to receptors on a special type of white blood cell called an antigen-presenting dendritic cell, and the other fold binds to glycosaminoglycans. The um, glycosaminoglycan binding fold can also directly kill bacteria and fungi as part of its immune function. All right. And uh, do you know how long it takes um, the protein to refold to perform a different function? Yeah. So um, previous work from our lab has shown that the protein can switch from one fold to the other and then back um, in the span of about one second. Whoa, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very fast switching. All right. Um, so, yeah. So like I mentioned earlier, um, you reconstructed the entire evolutionary history of this protein. Um, can you explain the process by which you're able to do this, as well as your findings after completing this reconstruction? Yeah, great question. So um, we used a technique called ancestral sequence reconstruction. And what we did is we collected 457 different chemokine sequences from um, a bunch of different species. And then based on those sequences, we performed a multiple sequence alignment where you line all the sequences up. Um, and then we used a software called PhiML to statistically calculate the most likely sequences of ancestors of those modern day sequences. Um, so we did this with the amino acid sequences. And you can imagine um, broadly, for example, if you had um, a modern day lizard and a fish, and you had to figure out what the ancestor of those two species looked like, um, you could calculate the most likely ancestor. We did this on the molecular level for protein sequences. And what we found um, is that XCL1 evolved from the same ancestor as another chemokine protein called CCL20, um, and that they, they shared an ancestor, which we call in the paper ancestor zero which has only one folded structure. So XCL1 evolved from a protein with one fold um, to have two folds in the modern day protein. Um, and then we took the calculated sequences and we made the proteins that they represent in the laboratory and we checked them to see if they were metamorphic or not. Um, and we found that the older ancestors are not metamorphic, but two of the newer ancestors are metamorphic. 
so if it evolved from a non-metamorphic protein into a metamorphic protein, mm -hmm. um, what caused it to evolve? Because is, is the protein itself alive or was it, was it, um, or did it evolve because the human body itself is evolving and therefore the protein evolves? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the way that evolution works is um, that changes in an organism's genetic code um, can be passed on to offspring. And so um, you can imagine that maybe an organism from hundreds of millions of years ago had a protein with one fold. Um, and it had one, the protein had one fold because the gene for the protein encoded for a specific amino acid sequence that could only fold into one structure. But then if a random mutation in that organism caused the organism's protein to have two folds, and once the protein had two folds, it made the organism better able to survive and replicate, then all of the organism's progeny would have the mutation that allows the protein to have two different folds. Um, and therefore, that um, gene for a fold switching protein would get passed on more often. Um, and then future organisms would have the fold switching protein. Did that make okay. sense? Yeah, yeah, I, I got it. Okay. Um, <laughs> Doing my best. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wanted to go back to, uh, to the evolutionary history of this um, protein. You found that the oldest ancestor of this protein, um, like you mentioned earlier, had one stable fold. Um, mm -hmm. And a bit later in the protein's uh, ev evolution, you detected two separate folds. Mm -hmm. um, however, during this stage, I read that finding the ancestral form was more likely. Um, yes. And then a bit later in its evolutionary history, the protein seemed to be um, less likely to be found in, in its ancestral form than its new one. And finally, in its current place in its evolution, it seems to be equally likely um, uh, to find it in, in its ancestral form or its new form. So based on the, the functions of these two forms, what do you think caused this evolutionary trend? Yeah, that, that's a really great question. Um, so you're right that what we saw is that um, the first metamorphic ancestor was mostly in the old fold. And then the next metamorphic ancestor was mostly in the new fold and the modern day is in each fold equally. Um, and so what that suggests is that the protein is evolving to have both folds on purpose. Um, and we think that that might happen because since the protein can switch back and forth between its two folds so quickly and reversibly, um, it would be able to be in the right fold at the right place and the right time. And so what I mean by that is if you imagine a person has an infection and the immune system needs to fight it off using this protein, um, close to the site of the infection, the protein would want to be in the fold that can directly kill bacteria and fungi, which is the new fold. Um, further away from the site of infection, the protein would want to be in the old fold, which can bind to receptors on white blood cells and call the white blood cells over to help fight the infection. So you wouldn't want it to be in the receptor binding fold close to the infection because it needs to fight off the infection there as fast as it can. And you wouldn't want it to be in the receptor binding fold. Um, uh, you wouldn't want it to be in the um, antibacterial fold, sorry, further away from the site of infection because there's no bacteria there and you would rather the protein be able to bind receptors and pull the cells over. And so um, by being able to switch folds quickly and reversibly, the protein can optimize a given function by optimizing a given fold at the right place in the right time. All right. And um, another question that I had, I don't think there's a, a definite answer to, but I just wanted your thoughts on it. Um, mm -hmm. If this is so advantageous, then why aren't all proteins metamorphic? Like, wh why do we have like, two specialized proteins? Yeah, that's that's a really good question to which we don't know the answer for sure. Um, I think that certain proteins don't necessarily need to do um, two functions for the same 
purpose. Like XCL1 is doing two functions for its immune response, whereas perhaps proteins that are um, solely being used for metabolizing food into energy um, might not need to be in multiple different places in the body at the same time to do that. They just need to be wherever um, the um, energy needs to be made. But on the other hand, um, you could imagine that it might be advantageous for all proteins to be able to do multiple folds and switch quickly. Um, if each fold was stable enough to avoid being degraded by the cell. Um, however, metamorphic proteins are interesting because they need to have each fold not be too stable um, so that the protein is able to switch. And sometimes scientists think that proteins that are relatively unstable are not evolutionarily favored and rather evolution favors proteins that are, that are more stable um, because these proteins are less likely to get broken down. Um, and so certain proteins might really need that stability more than they need the ability to switch functions. But in the end of the day, I'm not totally sure and we don't totally know how to answer that question all right um i had one question i think i just forgot it but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll see if i remember it later <laughs> um so um now i wanted to uh come to the to the recent uh development of an ai program known as AlphaFold. so th this was developed uh, developed by google deep mind as you probably know and it predicts how protein will fold in three-dimensional space based on solely its genetic sequence. Uh, how does your discovery impact the accuracy and potential scope of, uh, scope of AlphaFold? Um, does it take into account the possibility of metamorphic proteins, uh, AlphaFold, I mean, and could you speak in general of how these two discoveries impact one another? Yeah, that is an awesome question. And I have been thinking about this um, after reading about the recent success of AlphaFold in the most recent um, structure determination competition called CASP. And so AlphaFold is really good at predicting the structure of a protein um, based on its training set of protein structures that we know. And what's important to know about the the body of knowledge of protein structures is that about 85% of the structures have been solved by a technique called x-ray crystallography. And x-ray crystallography is only able to solve a protein structure if all the protein is in one fold um, and forms a highly ordered crystal. So it's best for studying the structures of proteins with one fold that are relatively stable and are able to crystallize. Um, so AlphaFold is going to have the most success uh, predicting structures solved by crystallography. Metamorphic proteins are much more difficult to study by crystallography because they're so highly dynamic and they have multiple different structures. So any crystal data you were able to get would probably be very confusing because you're trying to use um, a technique that's been designed for proteins with one fold. So I think that it would likely be more difficult for alpha fold to predict the structures of proteins with more than one fold. Um, also, the paradigm in the field has been that people expect most proteins to only have one folded structure. Um, and so structure prediction has been focused for a long time on just predicting a single structure for each protein. However, new techniques are being developed to predict whether or not protein sequences will be metamorphic. And these are, relatively speaking, in their infancy. Um, so predicting structures of proteins with one fold um, has been a goal for decades. Searching for metamorphic proteins by predicting whether a sequence will fold into two folds has really only been um, in the, like, an active project in the field for, like, within the last 10 years. Um, and so I think it will be very interesting to see how predictive techniques progress, um, which right now are relatively simple um, 
and are more difficult to perform using artificial intelligence because the training set of metamorphic proteins that we know of is relatively small compared to the training set of proteins that we know have one fold. Um, and so I don't think that alpha fold and metamorphic protein structure prediction have really yet intersected, but I think that this is likely to happen within the next couple of decades um, if I'm correct in my hypothesis that there are more metamorphic proteins out there than we ever expected before. All right. Um, and do you know if AlphaFold, when, when it um, studies a protein, does it look for one specific fold or does it take into account that there could be many possible folds? Like when it gives you an answer, does it just give you one answer or does it say there's like a certain percent chance of it um, having this fold or it having this fold? Hmm. I don't actually know for sure about the output of AlphaFold, but I think um, the way that it works is that it takes in a sequence and um, as it begins to predict a fold, it optimizes around that fold. So it starts to converge to one folded structure. Um, there are different structure prediction methods that um, work a little bit differently and very new research is showing that certain predictive methods, for example, using TR Rosetta, um, are able to identify multiple different folded structures or different energy minima. Um, but that research is still very new. All right. So, so if, if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that, say, for example, you asked AlphaFold to um, give you the, the, um, how XCL1 would fold, it would only give you one of the possible ways it would fold, right? Yes. One or none. It might have right. difficulty predicting a structure at all. I, I haven't actually tried it. That would be interesting to see if I could use AlphaFold to predict the structure of XCL1. Yeah, it, it's on GitHub, right? They, they made it um, free I think for it's use. publicly available now, yeah. Yeah, hmm. that, Maybe that would actually that. be cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, finally, could you tell us a bit about the implications of your research and maybe some ways that you could extend your research in the future? Yeah, great question. So I would say um, there are two main broad implications from our research. And one is that because, like you said, the protein evolved from mainly being in one structure to mainly being in a new structure, and then came back to being 50-50. Um, this suggests that metamorphic proteins, or at least XCL1, are not just proteins that are caught in the middle of evolving from one fold to another. So some scientists have thought that maybe metamorphic proteins are in the middle of evolving from one structure to a new structure, and therefore they're super rare because they um, are sort of evolutionary accidents. However, our data suggests that XCL1 evolved to be metamorphic on purpose, which suggests that if that's true for other metamorphic proteins, then maybe there are more metamorphic proteins out there in the world than people expected before. And it would be important to look for them because um, sometimes therapeutics are uh, developed by looking at the structure of a protein and then seeing how you can target that specific structure to enhance or turn down a certain function. But if you're only looking at one structure of a protein that really actually has two, you're missing out on half of the therapeutic opportunities to make new drugs for patients. The other main finding of our paper um, or main broad implication is that we looked at XCL1's evolutionary history and sort of narrowed down the molecular changes that needed to happen in order for XCL1 to evolve from having one fold to having two folds. We identified a specific set of amino acid changes um, from three main categories of changes that needed to happen. And so based on that information, we have sort of identified nature's instruction manual for how to make a metamorphic protein. What I've been working on lately, and I'm really interested in doing next, is trying to use that instruction manual to design our own fold switching proteins in the laboratory that have never been seen before in nature. And these could be used for things like molecular sensors or switchable therapeutics, components of molecular machines, or even self-assembling materials.
Um, and so based on what we've learned from evolution, I hope that we can employ those principles um, and design new proteins that switch folds. All right. Uh, thank you for that. Th um, those are basically all of the questions I had. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to be on our podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me on. This has been a lot of fun.